All right, as promised, here is the stupid fast version of the history of higher criticism. In the earliest days of Christianity, we don't see higher criticism happening. They're so close to the source historically, they weren't trying to bridge a historical context. They had clarity on who wrote the different books of the Bible. Only one book of the Bible where the authorship was even meaningfully in question made it into the New Testament, and that was Hebrews, which everybody was content to just call anonymous in authorship. So it's not really a thing. We see a little bit of text criticism happening in the era of the Latin Vulgate with Jerome, but even there, higher critical questions don't really meaningfully gain traction and start to affect the conversation until all the way up in the 17th century when a guy named Benedict Spinoza, a Dutch philosopher and a brilliant man, noticed some of those patterns I was referencing about the authorship of the first five books of the Old Testament and started jotting down some stuff about that and supposing some theories about maybe the authorship not being what the historical view had always been. So that kind of lays dormant for a little while, and then we get into the 18th century. There's a guy named Herbert Marsh, whose work is representative of a lot of other people's effort as well, and he looks at the first three books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which all tell the story of Jesus, and he notices that there's kind of a weird relationship between them. And he supposes that Mark must have come first, and that both Matthew and Luke depended on Mark as a source. But Matthew and Luke, he notices, don't seem to inform each other at all, and he suspects there might have been a couple of other mystery documents floating around out there that they were depending on. Along comes another German guy named Friedrich Schleiermacher who did a ton of stuff in the world of biblical studies, but the one thing I want to point out is that he supposes that there must have been some kind of long-lost source that the early church had of the sayings of Jesus. And he doesn't think Mark had access to that, but he suspects that Matthew and Luke might have had access to that. So again, we're into source criticism here. Johann Eichhorn is another German scholar who goes back to some of the questions that Spinoza was asking a long time earlier and wonders about not just the authorship of the first five books of the Old Testament, but the authorship of lots of other books of the Old Testament. A little bit later on, David Strauss argues that there's not anything supernatural about Jesus and that everything he did and said is either inaccurate or can be explained away if you look a little bit more closely at it. Finally, around the turn of the last century, 1900-ish, a scholar named Julius Wellhausen refines that theory about the authorship of the first five books of the Old Testament that Spinoza had started to flirt with into what gets called the JEDP theory about how those books happened, when those books happened, and who must have written them. Now, not surprisingly, throughout this whole 19th century movement, there are a bunch of people who have a very positive view of the Bible who are saying, wait a dang minute, no, here's a problem with your scholarship. Here's a problem with your scholarship. And as we get through that century, it really comes down to this. People who think that the supernatural could possibly be a thing are going to interpret the Bible in a certain way. People who reject any possibility of the supernatural being a thing are going to interpret the Bible a different way. And then there's going to be shades of gray in between. Well, there's also a not-so-fancy intellectual reaction against the higher criticism movement of the 19th century. And there's sort of this anti-intellectual hostility that develops through the 1800s, and that really flares up in the first half of the 20th century, where you're almost superstitious, but don't know why we believe in the Bible crowd, angrily disagrees with the, frankly, almost superstitious, don't know why we don't believe in the Bible crowd, and we see a social battle between these two, especially in the United States and Europe. Now, at this point in history, through the first half of the 20th century, there's still a decent amount of political agreement about things like human liberty and civil rights and stuff like that. There's still reasonable unity. But in the second half of the 20th century, we see this divide go even further as churches that have a more positive view of the Bible begin to really thrive and churches, frankly, that don't start to struggle. We see those that have a higher view of the Bible drift toward the political right and engage in political activism in opposition to the political activism of people who push toward the left, which actually for me is the other way around, but I've been doing it this way the whole time. Whatever, you get it. So what we have is a disagreement that starts as social and religious 
and in the last 50 to 75 years has devolved into something that looks more like our two political tribes that we're constantly dealing with today. Okay, home stretch. Here's why I'm making this video. One, this is a really important part of the story of the history of Christianity and the Bible. And whether you agree with the conclusions of higher criticism or not, it's just really important to wrap your brain around it so you can filter through all the stuff that you hear one way or the other. Two, I think that the divide that higher criticism caused in the church and even the greater Western world explains a lot of the friction we feel between ourselves and other tribes today. Those divisions that you see around you politically and socially are not just random phenomenon. They have their origins in theological disagreement about God and the Bible and people and all of these larger questions. I suppose another reason that I make a video like this is because I want to set you up to do your own study. That's kind of the point of this channel. It's for you to be able to think about the Bible for yourself and arrive at conclusions that make sense to you. What I've tried to avoid in this video is making a big strong case for why I'm pretty sure I'm right about everything and everybody else is a great big giant idiot. But if you want me to turn over my cards, it's pretty simple. I think the Bible is supernatural in origin. I think it's from God. I think it's reliable. I think that it stands up to all of these questions, not in like a defensive way, but I think all of these questions make us better at reading the Bible and seeing that God is indeed behind it. That's my take. Yours can be whatever you need it to be. I look forward to hearing what you have to say about this stuff. This has been a ton already. I'm going to wrap it up right there. I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. We'll see you soon.